Warning, this podcast is a Korea Black production. This is a podcast for adults only. It is not a podcast for people who think podcast hosts should be emotional friends, spiritual advisors, surrogate parents, or role models for their children, grandchildren, or potential offspring. This podcast may contain all sorts of trigger warning type content such as graphic language, harsh judgments, and microaggressive behavior. If you are a sensitive person or reality challenged, or you only listen to podcasts that agree with your religious views, personal philosophy, ideology, or feelings about life in general, please do not listen to this podcast. All comments, compliments, and complaints should be sent to Korea Black at koreablackproductions.com. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am back with Mr. David. And today we are going to do At the Mountains of Madness. Now, this isn't the actual story by H.P. Lovecraft. This is the audio drama inspired by At the Mountains of Madness, H.P. Lovecraft story. And it's done by the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society. So I'm a big audible guy. And I started noticing that they were doing audio dramas of H.P. Lovecraft's various stories. I, I think they have about 20 or 21 of them. I love these things. I don't know David's opinion yet, but I love these. I love audio dramas, period. But I love uh, period piece audio dramas because it's sort of like little mini Indiana Jones stories, except the audible version of it. And so I'm a huge fan of these cosmic horror stories, which is basically who, well, I mean, he started, kind of started it, H.P. Lovecraft. Yeah. And so I'm a big fan of that. And I love the weirdness of it. I'm not big on tentacle monsters, but I'm I'm big on. You'll find that's very popular. Yeah, very I know. Popular. <laughs> I'm big on it I'm really big is. on the adventure and the fact that you're in some old rickety plane that might not make it. I'm well, always trying like, to get. You like to go into the crypts, so you know where you like to go. Yeah, I'm always trying to get David to do this kind of stuff where we go on a boat or a plane that may not make it, but we'll make it because we can do it. Yeah, okay. And he just doesn't, he's like, no. So, <laughs> like a car that runs out of gas sometimes, Mr. David is. But anyway, I just like that kind of stuff and this kind of venture. So I just thought it would kind of be cool to do this story. Before we get into this, what did you think of this story, Mr. David? I loved it. I definitely like listening to the older stuff, even though this is not, like you said, the, the original. It's an audio drama. But I like hearing those types of stories. I like hearing the older writers, the older storytellers and stuff like that. Yeah. I feel like it helps you see how the whole writing genre just kind of changed over time. And I think it's, I love it. So I will say the only thing about it is that static. <laughs> now that I did not like. So they try to make this authentic. So we'll, and I, and I was going to mention this when I get in, actually into the review. Yeah. As the explorers are actually in the Antarctic, they're getting sending radio transmissions back to a radio announcer and to give us more of an authentic experience. They make sure you can't hear shit. That's what they do. They will make s- static noise, like the, the radio signals breaking up, and it's supposed to make you feel like you're there, like you're part of the audience. Mr. David apparently did not appreciate that. Okay, if I'm going to listen to something, I want to hear it. I want to be able to understand what people are saying. Now, I understand trying to make it authentic, but if I can't even hear it, I don't even know what's going on in the story. That doesn't make sense. I could hear stuff. And apparently he's not alone. On the audible reviews, there was a bunch of people who complained that that was too much noise and they were going too overboard on the static. I don't know. It didn't really bother me. Yeah. uh But I'm assuming most of those people who complain were millennials. So anyway, I, I I thought it was okay. And I just felt like I was there. I felt I was part of the team sometimes. And then sometimes I felt like I was sitting there in my old house in the 1930s listening to this, which I'd be yeah. a real old dude by now. But 
I thought it was cool, and I love this kind of stuff, and I love this genre. This is based on H.P. Lovecraft, like the Expeditions to the South Pole by Ernest Shackleton. It's a hard trek to go to the middle of nowhere <laughs> on a, on that continent because it's just snow and ice. There's not a lot of food, there's, and there's a billion ways you can die. Especially around that time, though. Think of that time period. Yeah, because that you know this is 1930 or 1931, something like that. So clearly, you you don't have. I mean, they had planes and they had sled dogs <laughs> and they had tents and fire, you know. But they don't have like all the kind of uh, comforts that we would like if the, our military went there today. You don't have that. It was really a tough trek. Yeah, you know, I'm sure the money wasn't great, but people had to do something. So he he was able to get people to go. But that that was what that was based on. His journey to the South Pole, which, uh, if I remember right, damn near killed him. <laughs> but he did it to be the first man there. And then there was another expedition, a bird. He said he had found a the hollow earth, the uh, where people supposedly lived under the ground. And I don't know where all these people are today, but there was a civilization underneath of the surface of the earth. And that the earth really has a hollow part of it. I don't, I'm not saying the, the, it's center, it's the whole thing is hollow. There are parts of the earth that have pockets of hollowness there where people stay and live. There are underwater seas, that there's enough water on this planet to have underwater seas. And the plates that all the continents slide on have hollow points as they get closer to the core. I've heard about this since I was a kid and I was always fascinated by the hollow earth thing. I'd also heard about it that supposedly when the world war two ended, some of the Nazis went to South uh, Antarctica and that's where they hid and they found this civilization made peace with them or whatever. And some of them went to South America and some of them went to South uh, Antarctica and they lived there until they died or they could still be there. And they just have the Nazi children. I don't know. I thought that was kind of cool because I like World War II stuff, but it always gives to that mythology about Hitler still alive. And I mean, yeah, how was yeah. he still alive now? But then there's that movie that they saved his brain. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't even know about that one. I never even heard of that one. God forbid you die before me, but if, if you do, I'm going to cut your head open and save <laughs> your brain. Uh, I, I don't. I don't need you to do that. I'm gonna put it in the body of a polar bear so we can I can go visit you really in at the South Pole. Yes. <laughs> That's fucked up. Well, I don't I want you to live. I don't want you to die. A polar bear? I mean Well, polar bears are big and strong. Okay. All right. You know? I I'm, mean, I'm don't you ever watch the, the Coca-Cola commercials where the polar bears drinking the Coca-Cola? No, I don't watch cable. No. I don't have cable. All no. right, then. You're a cableist? Watched- no, I just don't have cable. You're a cableist. I don't even know what that is. I would. <laughs> I would... <laughs> I, so I will be, just so y'all know, I will be saving Mr. David's brain if anything happens to him because I don't want him to go away until I'm dead. So there you go. All right. <laughs> so now, <laughs> now so how, does the, how, does, how does this book start? <laughs> All right. So this. Like I said before, it start, it's set in the 30s and 40s, so it starts with a, like a radio broadcast. And the announcer's talking about, it's kind of like in a flashback mode, he's talking about the tragic expedition that went to Antarctica. Because a lot of people died on this journey, and the reason it's coming up again is because there's another team that plans on going to the South Pole to, I guess, find whatever the first team found, or at least look around and see what they can find. So it starts off, we hear Professor Lake. He is part of the first team that went to Antarctica. And this is before he goes on this journey. And they're talking about how he wants to go. And he's looking forward to exploring this part of the world because hardly anybody's ever been there. And this might, the way they're doing it, he might be the first human ever to be there, at least in modern history. Then it jumps forward to another professor talking about the expedition. And he was part of the team that was part of Mr. Professor Lake's team. Although most of the people on that team died uh, that we know of. As far as we can tell, there was only two that came back. I mean, by the end of this version, because I know other people have done different versions of the story. And I think some of the other people got back. But in this version, 
All I can tell is two people came back, and that'd be Professor Dwyer and and Dan Forth. I forgot about Dan Forth, but there's a reason why. But go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. So we pick up there. Professor Dwyer is talking about this, and the radio announcer is asking him, so why are you coming clean when you refuse to tell what happened before? And he said, because there's another team of explorers called the Stockmore Expedition that is going, and he's trying everything he can to make sure they don't go because of the horrors he saw when he went there. And But they don't really care because they want to go. Maybe they figure out a way to make some money off of this. And then Professor Dwyer even has pictures. They took pictures of when they went there to prove the horrors that he saw and his team saw when they were there. I got a question. So do you think that was smart? Because only two people came back from his expedition. Yeah. Why let the whole world know if most likely they're going to all die? (laughs) (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Which makes more sense, though. Well, remember, he doesn't want the team to go, though. But now the whole world's going to go. Well, I mean, it depends. See, yeah. even with those photographs, a lot of people probably think Professor Dwyer is probably a nut job. And that those photographs yeah. are probably doctored, fake, I mean, whatever. You, you saying, are you saying um, 30s cameras? Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. 1930s cameras. Yeah, I, would, I probably wouldn't believe it either. I'm assuming the reason that other team wants to go is because they, there's some kind of financial gain to them going. I guess. It doesn't make any difference that the other teams that went died. That was them. We're a little smarter. We're a little younger. We're a little better than that team. That's that hubris, see? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it always happens. Every every time someone doesn't make That's it. That's the problem in the first place. Well, clearly you wouldn't have been on that team. No, 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 no. I, I would have been at home. But that's okay because me and you would have been on the first team. <laughs> I don't want no sloppy seconds. So you saying only me and you was gonna make it back? Well, I'd hope you make it back. <laughs> I'll at least bring back your brain. <laughs> I can fit it in a big old mason jar. And just oh my bring god! It back. I would. I would hope you make it back. Okay. I gotta make it back. Who's gonna tell the story if I don't make it back? <laughs> All right. Okay. See. I was just oh, saying that. that I'm always make... looking out for you. Yeah. You know? <laughs> storytelling back then I, I i definitely noticed with like arthur c clark and things like that yeah they, they it doesn't necessarily have to be a real reason to do anything no just, they do it for the adventure just a, <laughs> it's just a plot point to get you to the next plot point right like, that's it yeah i don't mind that today we've gotten too sophisticated with it because you have to justify the reason and why you go and- it's a different type of storytelling and I think a lot of people miss that. They don't want to listen to it because they think it's going to be boring. But it's just a different type of story. That's it. They wrote differently. In modern society, they want to know the whys and hows and all that stuff. And back in these stories, they didn't do all that. And the reason you're listening to this is escapism and it's entertainment. So you're not trying to dissect it like it's a science project. Well, I am. You're just supposed <laughs> to sit there and enjoy it. And if there's a part where I got to cut open your head to rescue your brain, they don't sit there and talk about how. Please don't tell that story. We don't have to tell that story. I'll tell y'all another day about the day I saved Mr. David's brain. Yeah. I'll throw that in the (laughs) stories with the lion hunting, bear hunting, elephant hunting stories that I've done, you know, and that time I went into that volcano, but (laughs) I'll say that for a different day. Okay. I'm just saying, I don't, I don't, I don't know you did any of that. But <laughs> because you weren't there, <laughs> I, that's why I'm telling you the story. If that's what you want to say, that's fine. You All weren't right. you weren't there, so you don't know. Did I ever tell you about that mo- that monster man eating ape I found? <laughs> no, I'll tell you. Talking about Godzilla. <laughs> Godzilla's not an ape. <laughs> Godzilla's a reptile lizard. So you're talking about King Kong? It wasn't King Kong. I, I can't tell you that story now. It's for a different day. Right. But yeah, there was an adventure I went on where there was this monster man eating, killing people ate thing. We called it George. No, there you Woman. go. <laughs> <laughs> That's a different George. And it wasn't none of George's kids that he named all George. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, man. Anyway, he, before the millennial got me sidetracked. So we get there. The professor has a team of people with them. Seven graduate students, nine mechanics, and 55 Alaskan sled dogs. That's a lot of dogs, by the way. 
Well, they got a lot of gear. I'm just thinking, had this been the day, you'd have those snowmobiles. <laughs> so you wouldn't need these stinking dogs. I don't like dogs. And they shit all over the place. Sometimes. And you got to feed them. No. 55. You got to feed yourself. There's 55 dogs. <laughs> That's a, I'm pretty sure they're shitting all over the place. So they establish a base camp. And the first thing they see is there's, of course, a lot of snow, ice, penguins, and seals. They realize that this is going to be like their home base, and they have to set up another camp because they're going to they have a, I guess, from what I could tell from the story, they have multiple planes. So they use one, they use planes to get to their home base camp, but then they use another plane to get them to their, the secondary base camp, which is 700 miles south of the original base camp. I don't, they don't say how many they have, but I'm assuming it's at least two, but it might be three or four. They end up splitting up into two different groups. Professor Dwyer stays at the home base camp and Professor Lake, which will be the team that me and Mr. Dave will be on. We go to the secondary base camp. And when they get there, they see limestone caves filled with fossils. Now, these fossils are from animals that supposedly are hundreds of millions of years old that are not in the world today. And they're so they're they're like taking pictures and amazed by it. And then they start seeing these really weird looking creatures with various tentacles and starfish shaped heads. And they say, I'm just going to repeat what they said. It's a mixture of animal and vegetable. Not plant life, vegetable. So I guess you have tentacle creatures with like carrots sticking out, tomatoes, that kind of shit. I don't know. Maybe I don't know. Is that, is tomato, maybe tomatoes are fruit. I don't know. Yeah, it actually is because I think because it has seeds. But go ahead. I, I don't know. I don't know. I know a starship that had seeds too, and they didn't call it tomato. What was that? It was a starship. <laughs> and it had seeds to, to plant on another planet so they could eat. They didn't call it like Starship Tomato. <sighs> the same. All right. Getting into that higher math type <laughs> shit. So, so yeah, so that's when we first get the first glimpse of these. There's some kind of weird things that at least were in Antarctica because they've never seen any of these creatures anywhere else, at least in their other expeditions around the globe. And this also is, um, for those of you who don't know, H.P. Lovecraft, I don't know if he's the inventor of it, but he's the one who gets the most credit of cosmic horror creatures. And the re- and the way he would write his stories is he didn't really, they, they wouldn't be like really cool looking creatures. They would be just these abnormal things like a science experiment that went wrong. He would also have creatures that he didn't like to describe because he said looking at them was so horrible that you could not, you would go yeah. mad. You'd go yeah. insane just by looking at them. But usually when people try to interpret it, you'll see creatures like their big globs of blackness or green oozing fluid coming out of them with lots of tentacles and lots of eyes and, of course, lots of teeth. Well, see, that gets to... Uh, it's based on one of the actual monsters in this story and also in um, a few other stories that I've you know listened to. Yeah. So it's... Uh, I think it's a creature called the Shagoth. Yeah, is that's that that's that tentacle creature with the you know the the eyes floating and everything like that. Although he does have different creatures, he has oh yeah. just about to mention yeah. he has the elder things. So yes. he, mm-hmm. they find the bodies of the elder things. That, well, that's what they call. So that them. was the fossils that Sean was talking about, right? The, the very abnormal ones. And um, now the shagas are are created by the elder things. Yeah. So they were like mm-hmm. their Frankenstein version type monster of the th- or whenever because according to the the world of hp lovecraft these things lived on earth before humanity was even born so they were the actual rulers of the planet way before we started building walmarts and 7-elevens and shit they had their own thing cities and all kinds of things um, but the shogoths are created beings from what i could tell in this story i don't know about in the original story that they had made from pieces of themselves and kind of manipulated to grow up into a different slave type creature. And that's what, and they, for some reason, they gave him a hideous name called Shogos. Shogos. Something yeah. like that. Hmm. I, don't, I wouldn't name my child that, but no. maybe Mr. No. David would. But I would. No, I'm, I'll, I'll stick with like Teddy or something like that. Teddy? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a, that, that that's a boring name. 
That's uh, a boring hey, name. Better than it's a golf. <laughs> oh, what's that thing from Prince of Persia that was chasing you around in the second game? What was that called? Do you remember that? Oh, um, it had some kind Dahaka. of weird. The, 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 yeah, I love that name. Dahaka, That's what I would call yeah. my baby. Yeah, the Dahaka. <laughs> Dahaka, come here. Dahaka, I told you about that. Like That's it. actually a king of um Egypt, Tahar- uh, Taharka. Not my boy. Well, no. he just, just gets saying. in trouble. I have to like just beat I'm his just ass. Saying, maybe that's where they got the name from. I don't. I mean, well, it's a Persian. Yeah. Well, H.P. Lovecraft got his names from obviously things that happened before him. So he would have been hitting Egypt because he was always reading about discoveries in different. Like he never left anywhere. He would mm-hmm. just read about newspaper accounts of different discoveries that happened or places people would go, jungle type environments, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And he just this incorporated is, um, it into his stories. Kind of, kind of. Um, who's uh, who's the one who did uh, War of the World, War of the Worlds? I can't think of his name. The original Orson Welles. The uh, Orson Welles did the radio it's, broadcast. It's, Orson Welles. It's kind of in that same vein. Well, it's, it was would, set in the '30s too. Same. Yeah, time. yeah. I would say that it's in that same vein, but I think. Like like Sean said, Lovecraft, um, he he definitely mastered that genre of writing, I think, personally. Well, I just I, I like the fact that I love cosmic horror. I don't yeah. need I don't need like the Star Trek stuff where you can kind of figure out what the evil is mm-hmm. or the enemy yeah. is and yeah. rationalize with it. No, you can't rationalize with cosmic horror. Cosmic horror shows up at your door. It's not trick or treating, it's coming there to eat you. It doesn't want to negotiate, talk. Or make the world a better place. It wants you to be dinner. That's it. The uh, what is it? The the Book of the Dead, the Necronomicon book. Yeah. Um, not to be confused with the Bible. Go ahead. Uh, no, I wasn't talking about the Bible. <laughs> well, everybody in the Bible's dead. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, except supposedly one guy, but everybody else is dead. The opening scene, basically, like Sean's, like some coming for you, was a man and his wife. In their house, the house starts shaking, as it does, and then it just falls, and they both get up, and one's got a broken hip, and then the shagals just come in and eat them, and take them yeah. away. That's it. There's no, you know, there's no rhyme or reason to what happens. There's no rhyme or reason to cosmic horror. It just happens, and I just love this genre. I love the style. I like the way they create the story. Yeah, it just kind of takes me back when I'm listening to it. Some people might think. When you listen to the radio broadcast, it's a little campy, but it's supposed to be a little campy yeah. because they're trying to play towards the 30s, the way those people used to talk and act and all that kind of stuff. But I don't care. And I usually don't like campy, but I like this stuff. So that's just me. So they're at the camp. And I told you, as they do, they separated. And every time teams separate, you know, a whole bunch of people are going to die. So Professor Lake takes his team. They make the advanced camp. And as I said, they find... The bodies of the elder, well, he calls them the elder things because I guess he learned that term from his research, but they find the dead bodies of them. Now, here's the difference between this story and I guess the original story. In this story, we find out uh, coming up that this whole advanced camp team was wiped out and one guy disappears, but all the other bodies have been massacred. But in the original story, it was the elder things that woke up some kind of way and massacred all of the people or most of them anyway. And this story, they don't even mention it. They just, we get to the camp and then there's just dead bodies and blood everywhere. So that's, I'm just saying that because there are going to be, for those who are diehard HP Lovecraft fans, there are differences. And because this was an adapted version, there are differences in this story as compared to what the original written story was the great alignment so which would be i believe all of the planets in the solar system all in eclipse in a straight line and it basically unlocks the great old ones to come into the realm of earth and they awaken and they just massacre everybody everybody on the planet i always wonder how come we can't go there well you can but it, it would probably be a little tough unless you know certain things. I'm thinking it's sort of similar to what the in Dark Tower is like the prim. Yes, yeah, I, I can see that. Yeah, yeah. I want to go to the prim. Okay. Well, this place is deep, deep underground. Well, yeah, but it's still a doorway, though. Yeah, it's a doorway, but uh, the 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 Mad Arab Al Azul, whatever his name is. Yeah. Um, he's he's supposed to be the writer 
um, author of the Book of the Dead, the Necronomicon. Yeah. Um, which is kind of confusing because the because there's another Book of the Dead which is Egyptian, which is kind of confusing. But that's a different book. But he probably got well, the idea from from that from the yeah the yeah yeah. Yeah, no, I know. I was just saying it's, it's I, I had to figure that out when I first listened to the story. But um he wrote it and he went down there and discovered the Chagoths, the great old ones, and all of that stuff. And he wrote a book about it. Yeah. I think he made a deal with either the great old ones or the Chagall. Or the devil. And well, might be the same thing. Might be Could one be. of the same. If it's trying and, to eat you, you would think it's the devil. Well, I do. I personally do. Yeah. Uh, there you go. Oh well. A little salt. We agree on something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we agreed to save your brain. No, we never agreed to that. Yes, we did. We never agreed to that. Yes, we did. But anyway, he betrays them and they kill him for it. This is how it goes. The way this story is given to us, it keeps going back and forth from present day to the flashback of Professor Lake's team. The team is wiped out. They Actually, first they lose radio contact with Professor Lake and his team. This concerns Professor Dwyer. He gets his team, gets on the plane. They fly the 700 miles. When they get there, they don't see any bodies. All they see is big patches of red blood everywhere. And they don't even see the dogs. So then their scouts, uh, they separate and start looking, and they eventually find the bodies. There's 10 men dead and 35 dogs dead. But when they do a count, they're short one guy. So that means one guy either survived or he was taken away somewhere. And there's two dogs missing. They believe the missing guy is a guy named Gedney. And he, I I assume he was either one of the graduate students or one of the mechanics, something. Because we don't really get into Gedney. They did mention he was one of the graduate students because he had went on another expedition with them. That's why somebody said he wouldn't act like that. He wouldn't behave like this. Because they were trying to figure out if one of the men killed everyone else. Yeah, because there's a, there's a dissecting. Remember, this is a scientific expedition. So they're going to dissect things. There's a tent they find where somebody dissected another human body and a dog. And so there's body parts throughout the tent. And they the only thing they could think of is that Gedney went Damon. Uh, I'm sorry, went mad. He went mad and he uh cut up, cut open some. I don't they don't even know why he did it. There's no clues to tell us why he was dissecting the bodies. They also realized that on the other 10 bodies. They've not just been murdered, they've been cut open and parts of their bodies were sliced off. So that leads us to think, at least they're not telling us this, but they were either cut off for consumption or they were just brutally murdered by Gedney. But how does Gedney kill 10 other men? Yeah, it just didn't make sense. Yeah, so it had to have been either the elder things or the Shagoths that did this. But in this story, the way this audio drama does, they never tell us that. We also learned that Gedney, well, at least they think it's Gedney, he sabotaged some of the equipment and the plane that brought them, their planes. They don't say how many planes they had. So they can't take off. There are bolts missing and parts missing. So the reason you do that is to prevent people from leaving. So whatever happened to Gedney, I know he didn't kill 10 guys. So I'm assuming they had, when they got there, they had found four bodies of the elder things. They were also mutilated as well. So then that kind of leads us to think that it may have been the Chagas. Yeah, yeah. But we're not sure because they don't say it in this story. But there are four bodies there and graves. Or Was it four? No, six graves. I'm sorry. It was a total of six graves that were there. And they found one body in there. They basically play on the fact that it's so blatant their ignorance of what's going on and the fact that they're just ignoring all of the real logical explanations for what's going on. Well, right, because the thing is, the less you know about something, the scarier it is. Yeah, exactly. You see, the, so that's why they did that. They don't want to tell you everything because in your mind, you're trying to figure out what happened, what what causes. Today, you bring in the CSI Las Vegas team and <laughs> Hiroshio from Miami, and he do his little thing with his coat and his sunglasses, mm-hmm. and they be figuring out from a hair sample that, you know, what the elder things of the Chagas did. Mm-hmm. But back then, they didn't have no CSI. You just had well, to do hunches and theories and a lot of people died. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say he's the third Batman. That's all I was going to say. He's talking about Horatio from <laughs> CSI Miami. Me and Mr. David believe that he steals a lot of his moves in the show from Batman. <laughs> you have to watch the show to know what I'm talking about. 
but the man is Batman without the cape and cow. His his cape and cow is those sunglasses because he doesn't talk unless he has to raise the sunglasses and cock his head to the right and then look at you. <laughs> if you watch that show, you'll see what I'm talking about. So anyway, Professor Dwyer believes that Gedney, who at this point is still alive, they think, went crazy and started dissecting the human bodies and dogs. However, in this story... We don't know if he took a plane or if he ran because where they're going, there's a mountain range that they're going to. And that's where the the title of the story comes from, At the Mountains of Madness. They know if they go across the mountain range, supposedly there's a city beyond the mountain range. Yeah, Professor Lake had uh, described it on one of the radio broadcasts, I believe, right? Yeah. but Yeah, so that's how we know it's there, yeah. But I'm trying to figure out how Gedney got there. Oh, I believe they said they saw after they checked the bodies in the tents. Um, and also one other thing, they they dissected mechanical things like uh, cans, like they dissected cans like they didn't know how to use them yeah. properly. What was the other thing? It was like a refrigerator or a generator or something. They just took apart in its component pieces. Yeah, they just took it apart. And then they also found matchsticks lined up in weird patterns left at each you know scene and then at the end of their searching they find sled tracks and remember two dogs and one man are missing yep so somebody took the sled and the two dogs and left on the sled and that's when they decide to go looking for them right yeah because they know I mean, like I said, the other... That's how they knew what direction to go. That's basically what I'm saying. No, no, no. But what I was saying... Oh, so you're saying he took the sleds to go through the the. Yeah, he took the sled and the dogs. Now... Instead of taking the plane. Instead of taking... Maybe he couldn't fly the plane. He's a graduate student. However, because we don't really get into this in this version, he might have been taken over himself, infected some kind of way, and didn't know how to use the plane. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know, because we don't know. But yeah, you're right. He, I forgot about the sled dogs. He did take the dogs because they, they saw tracks. And I, that's a hard journey through those mountain passes. Well, because it yeah, took I him know. forever to fly over the mountains. And you're going to do it on sled dogs? Well, I don't think it, to me, like hearing the conclusion of the story, I don't think it was, if it was, like you said, if it was getting, he was he was either taken over or um, something something took his dead body with it. True. But that, but still, then who, those things wouldn't know how to use the sled dogs, though. Well, I was, see, well, I was thinking whatever is taking apart these mechanics, because uh, I think, what was the other professor's name? Not Lake. Um, Dwyer. Dwyer. Professor Dwyer says, no, this doesn't make sense. Who Who would take apart all of these mechanical things? It's almost as if they're trying to figure out how these things work. Yeah. Well, maybe. So, yeah, that's true. You know, if it figured out those things, it could definitely figure out a sled. Well, I would just think uh, you know. the dogs would have a hard well, time. Had, that's why maybe that's why Gedney was alive when he left. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I mean, that's maybe that's the only way the dogs would 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 you know pull the sleigh. You never know. So, despite all the death and destruction they find at the second base camp, Dwyer, a man after my own heart, says, "Mr. David, we're gonna go anyway. I don't care how many dead bodies are here." I don't care if their body parts are missing. We got to keep going in the name of science. And I would have said the same thing if it was been Mr. B and Mr. David. Mr. (laughs) David would have said, do you not see all the dead people here? What does that tell you? What that tells me is they didn't make it. But we can. We can. (laughs) That's what that tells me. That's all. All you need is some spinach and some iced tea. Would at least tell you to go get some backup. I'm, I'm just, no, no, fuck that backup. Just, we don't need no backup. We don't okay. need that. We all, all we right. need to do is just keep going forward, and right. God will protect us. <laughs> <laughs> or in this case, science. <laughs> science too. Science and God are like our cross. It will okay. protect us against any. A evil. lot of a lot of people might disagree with that. But well, well, we'll see what happens, won't we? We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens, yeah. So they get back in their piece of shit plane, and these are one of those propeller planes, those Cessnas. I don't trust those shits at all, but then they always crash and run out of fuel, but whatever. So they take that, they fly over the mountains. The first thing they see is beautiful colors in the sky. So it almost feels like they're going into a different world when they cross over the mountain range. 
Then they finally come across this city. And this city is massive. It goes for several miles. And they, they just can't believe that this is even here. And they land the plane. Well, they actually, before they land the plane, Danforth doesn't want to land because he's saying that he doesn't know if we got enough fuel to go. Because they just keep going and going south, I guess. And he's going, we got to turn back or we're going to run out of fuel. And then Professor Dwyer says, we can't turn back without going to explore the city. We have to go and see this in the name <laughs> of science. You know, because that's what you do when you're almost out of fuel. That you is land. not what you do. That, that is, is exactly that is what, you, what do. you do. No. If, if, if the plane runs out of fuel, you just crash land it and you walk on foot, but you got to explore you know, that damn you, city. You, you did like to drive a lot with your with your uh with your gas light on. I'm just saying. <laughs> well, maybe you maybe that thrills you. You like, you know, that sense of adventure. Maybe that's what it was. But for me, that meant stop. Let's get some gas. First of all, the gas light is more of a decoration than anything. And if you're going downhill, it doesn't matter how much gas how you have. How is it decoration? It just it just looks how cool when it look? lights up. That's uh-huh. all. It looks cool <laughs> okay. when it lights up. It's just it's just another pretty light on the dashboard as far as well, I was Those headlights going to look good when you're on the side of the road and they keep passing you. And, That's all I got to say. And there's a way you can travel where you only go downhill. <laughs> yeah, you used to say that too. And That's I never right. Believe that either. That's right. Well, you were younger then. You still didn't believe it though. <laughs> but you no, were younger then. <laughs> it didn't make any sense. <laughs> it does make sense. What do you need gas for if you're going downhill? Oh my gosh. Okay, thank you. See, you can't answer. That's one of those questions that the universe just can't answer. There's a place I forgot exactly. I think it might be um, somewhere in the mountains of LA where your eye basically presents you an optical illusion that makes it look like you're going uphill. Yeah. So you assume that you're going uphill, but when you um, like pour water on the ground, the water, the water appears to roll uphill. Oh, okay. Uh, it's just like an optical illusion of the planet. It's well, it's cool. sort of like here, if you come, so for the, y'all who don't know, I live in the last stop before the kingdom of hell, which I call Las Vegas. And we are surrounded by desert and there's a place called the Valley of Fire. And when I first moved out here, when you're walking in desert, everything looks closer than how it really appears. So I was, there were some park rangers there telling me that um, I was asking them when I first got to Las Vegas, and I first went to the Valley of Fire, I said, I just want to know, so we can walk anywhere in this park. And if I just keep going that direction east, you're, gonna, you're not going to come out there and try to find me. And he told me, no, not unless they file a missing persons report. So I can just keep walking and make a camp out there and just disappear and you ain't going to bother me. He goes, nope. And I said, well, I was thinking about walking out to that little mountain over there. He goes, how far do you think that mountain is from here? <laughs> I said, it's about a mile, I guess. He goes, no, that mi- that mountain's about five to ten miles away. I was like, get the <laughs> fuck out of here. So when I, I came back and me and a friend of mine went hiking because I was looking for places to film out in the Valley of Fire and Lake Mead area. And I made the walk, and they that dude was not lying. It was at least five miles because there was this little ravine that we found when we got out there. And I was like, I was just, because it, it's kind of like hard to, there's a lot of sinking sand and all this kind of stuff. I was telling the guy I was with, I was like, you know what? I'm thinking maybe we should just stay the night here because I don't feel like making that walk back. But then the <laughs> problem is when the sun goes down it's in the cold. Valley of Fire, you, well, it's cold and you can't see anything. Yeah, There's no lights. And we didn't have any gear or anything. We just walked out there because I didn't think it was five miles. And it was really five, but we we picked the wrong time to go because we we started going out there in the afternoon. And this was yeah. in the winter, so it gets dark by 4 o'clock here. And I was like, fuck. So then we were hurrying back, and we were seeing snakes and scorpions and everything. I was like, I'm glad I didn't stay the night because I'm allergic to snakes and scorpions. <laughs> or anything that will kill me, I'm allergic to. This mm-hmm. is how I am. So okay. just to reiterate his uh, Mr. Davis' point that Things out here in the desert, the desert terrain, there's a lot of, that's where the, the phrase, uh, the word mirage comes from. It, it looks like something, but it's it's really your eyes playing a trick on you because of the way everything is set. But it's cool. Though. I like living in the desert. I don't necessarily like the people of Las Vegas that much, but I like living in the desert. I love the desert. I don't know if Mr. David likes the desert. He's been out here several times, but I don't know if he's a desert fan. I don't know. Um, I don't mind the desert. I like the desert. I like the sand. It's yeah. Cool. Yeah. Just bring water. 
<laughs> yeah, That's you have to bring sure. water in the desert because if you don't, you'll die. And then there's a lot of things out there that will eat you. So, well, yeah, that too. That makes that makes me remember that time about that that mountain lion that I saw that one day. But I'll tell that story another day. So um, he finally gets uh, <laughs> the pilot um, to land. What's his name? Del- Danforth. Danforth. That was, these names, boy. I just... That's not a hard name. Danforth? I ain't never met nobody named Danforth. Well, it's his, I don't know if it's first or his last name. I don't, I don't know. know either. It could be both. But I can see it as one a, name. But it's just short for Dan. If you just say Dan. No, it's long for Dan. <laughs> well, okay. Danforth can be shortened to Dan, <laughs> but I don't know if that's his first or his last name. I don't know. But Danford finally lands the plane after uh, he's convinced to. Yeah. And In the name they of science. Start exploring it. Yeah. For, I don't know why. I would turn around. They're scientists. But, that's the whole reason they're there. What's the point of coming out here if you don't explore the damn city? Uh, to make it home? That, that, damn that. <laughs> I want to see the city. I need this end, and he can, they need to take pictures. They have to because people, someone paid for you to come out here. All you've seen is some penguins, snow, and dead bodies. Well, what's crazy is the whole time after they land, they're basically both, well, at least Danford is thinking about how crazy they are for continuing. Like they, they literally know they're that what they're doing is insane. They know that, and that's what I'm saying. But it's it's no different than when astronauts go in space. We're not supposed to be in space, but we did it anyway. Some people would beg to differ. There's a there's a whole <laughs> bunch of ways we can die going out into space, but we go anyway. Just like this city. There's a whole bunch of ways you can die, but you do it anyway in the name of science. There's not like a point where, well, I guess there is, but I don't know if anybody's ever like outstayed their mission just to explore some stuff and possibly not make it back if you're doing it for science yes i guess you can talk about the challenger would be i guess the example well this is no different than people go into the ocean to explore okay yeah you know there's a whole bunch of ways you can die in the deep sea too but you do it in the name of science so you can bring back your results because if you don't go who's gonna go yeah i would say you that's, that's my point. Sean that, always wants to go. That's my point. Someone has to actually do it. If, uh, if no one does it, we'll never know. All right, Sean. I'm, I'm just, just saying. saying. Uh, well, all I'm saying is they know they were crazy. Uh, well, I, I don't care what the felt reason. That way. Dan Forth. The doctor didn't feel he was crazy until he got back and gave his radio interview. Now I was going to say he held that secret for how how many years? Oh, that, it was several. They don't say. Yeah, he. I mean, let's just say ten years, a whole decade. You know, he he was still felt like he was crazy. After but in, he got in, in the madness of the adventure, it didn't matter. In the yeah. it, he needed to to bring back this evidence of this city. Didn't how many people you think is gonna come out here? <laughs> you know, now you would probably come back with the military. But I like small groups. I like going out there with just squads of like four or five going out there. You like being outnumbered? Is that? Yeah. <laughs> you notice something else? No guns. Yeah, I noticed that. Yeah, nobody yeah. brought any guns because it's a science expedition. Yeah, I mean they weren't expecting anything like a penguin to come at them. In the name of science, people do all kinds of crazy things. That's just because someone's got to do it. You're compelled to do this to push mankind forward. Clearly, I would have to talk you into it. No, 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 no. You wouldn't have to talk me into anything. I'd say, Sean, listen. <laughs> I'm going to turn this plane around. <laughs> what? And if we try to grab this wheel, we both going to die. So we're, your choice. We're gonna, it's going to be a rough landing, but we're not going to yeah. die. Yeah, <laughs> we okay. might lose a wing, which means it's a long walk through those damn mountains, which we wouldn't have to walk through if you hadn't have fucked up the plane. <laughs> but You but, think those are the Kokostani Mountains? <laughs> Go ahead. Say your line. <laughs> no, I'm not going to say it. I was just, I was just wondering. <laughs> So anyway, they do land the plane. They grab some of their gear, camera equipment, and that kind of stuff. Because again, it's very important that he takes these pictures because he needs to show proof of what they've... It justifies the cost of the mission. They don't really say how much it is. Usually back then, they would try to find a rich guy to pay for it. The rich guy would make his money back off of what they could bring back, like gold or trinkets or 
some kind of statues or something like that. And that's how, because they put it in museums and have it tour around the world. And that's how the rich guy makes his money back. They don't get into that in this story, but that's generally from what I've read. That's how all these expeditions were paid, either by donations or someone sponsoring the trip. Yeah, they used to do that a lot, I uh, found in South America. What do they call them? Like fencers down there who would go into the pyramids and the jungles and steal statues and stuff like that. Yeah. Of the Inca and the Maya civilization and basically fence it and it'll end up in museums across the world and everything like that. So that's why the pharaohs would have people set up traps and stuff. Yeah. So yeah. tomb raiders wouldn't go in. Not the hot chick that Angelina Jolie is. These were just <laughs> dirty tomb raiders. <laughs> tomb raiders wouldn't go into the tomb and steal all the, the pharaoh's gold. So they set up all these elaborate traps. They'd also put curses. I don't know how effective a curse is, no. but I know how effective a trap is, you know, to protect against tomb raiders, not hot Angelina Jolie tomb raiders, but dirty ones. Like She was dirty in that movie. <laughs> no matter how dirty Angelina gets, she's still clean, as far as I'm concerned. All right. Anyway. There, then you're entitled to your opinion. Thank you. So... <laughs> So that's where a lot of that comes from is they were trying to, because they knew that as soon as a pharaoh died, and plus, if you didn't believe in the gods, then you sure as hell didn't believe in any damn curse. However, you did believe in spikes coming out the ground, <laughs> you know, or the ceiling collapsing on you. Like, it's, it's sort of like if you think about the movie Indiana Jones, The Raiders of the Lost yeah. Ark, the first one, if you yeah. think about that, that's what these tomb traps were like. And so that was to stop tomb raiders from coming in, stealing all the pharaoh's gold or who, whatever tomb it was. It was in South America, the emperor, king, whatever they were called back then. They enter the city. When we see the city, it's massive. Like I said, there's different shapes of buildings. Some of them are uh, they're cube shaped. Some of them are cones. Some of them are pyramid shaped, all different kinds. And the professor Dwyer, he's really impressed by this because he does not think man did this. He thinks this civilization was way before man walked the earth and he's they were much more advanced than we were to build this and then that's when we start getting a flashback of him talking to the radio announcer and we've learned that he believes that these people were from another world they were not indigenous to earth they came here from somewhere else they were much more advanced than us for whatever reason they decided to live here they didn't just live on land they built cities underwater in the deep sea as well so they were, if you can do that back then, they were much more advanced than we are. He doesn't justify any of this, how he knows this, except for, I guess, through murals that they find. Because they find a lot of murals on the walls, I guess, of the city. When they do find the fossilized uh, great old ones, they do say that they believe that they have lungs, gills. I guess they can breathe through their skin as well or something. Yeah. So they had three functions of breathing. As well, which helped, which allowed them to build a city underwater. Professor Dyer starts saying that he believes this is the city of the great old ones. And like I said, they are supposedly alien. They are foreign to this planet. They were able to move on land, fly, and swim to the deepest parts of the ocean. And then, as I said earlier, they created a slave race called the Shugas to build the cities, similar to what the Egyptians did with the Jewish people of the time having them build their pyramids and all that kind of stuff. But Shogos were created by the great old ones to build the pyramids. That was their whole purpose. And from what the description of them is, they're shapeless entities composed of jelly and tentacles and stalks for, that are holding their eyes up. They're just hideous things. They sort of look like the blob from the Brotherhood of Evil who the X-Men used to fight. Just you could, he's just, his power is to just blob out. He just gets really big and fat and he just, and his face gets all distorted. You can see his eyes, but his, his power is to just get fatter than he already is. They're goo. Like they're, and they're about 15 feet in diameter too. And they can at will basically produce any organ ever imaginable. Right. So they can, you know, pop, they pop eyes out that float on their surface. They pop, you know, arms out, they pop mouths out. It's really weird. Yeah, they were created to basically adapt to whatever terrain or situation they were in. Yeah. But their purpose was to be slave labor. And as does happen with all slave labor, they decided to revolt. Because the problem with the Shugoths is when they created them, I guess they didn't realize that as they would evolve, they become more intelligent. 
And when you become more intelligent, you start looking around saying, what the fuck are we doing? So they eventually rebelled against the elder things and started attacking them. The response from the other thing was to build more Shugoths that were bigger and nastier and deadlier. So you just have kind of have this Shugoth massive world war that we never saw. I would like to see that, though. <laughs> You know, it's sort of like the war in heaven that no one's ever seen, but everybody knows about. <laughs> yeah. I want to I see these wars that we never know about or anything. And the reason why we know that happened is because they found more of these murals. As I said earlier, a lot of the murals depicted the elder things having their heads ripped off. Yeah. So that means that the elder things probably lost that war or either they lost, they were losing the war and they went back to wherever they came from. We don't know. Now, another thing about, period pieces or this cosmic horror is like Sean was mentioning about the the things being so hideous that they couldn't be described. Well, these murals, they're written in a language that's, I guess, a picture language, but it conveys detail to you in such subtle ways that you can understand what they're trying to tell you, even though you guys don't even share a common language or species. It was like just reading a book, except they could convey it in pictures. They don't really go into how that works, but apparently by looking at it, it tells a story in detail just by looking at the picture. Yeah, but that was the the whole purpose of these cosmic creatures is that they were not only hideously ugly or grotesque or, or, or monstrous, but that they had a deep intelligence or some type of intelligence that we can't even grasp or think about. Yeah, because they come from a place of evil. They could also fly in space, too. That's how they got to Earth. They have wings, and they could fly in space and survive. Nothing good comes from space. Nothing. It will always eat you. The sun is there. That didn't come here, though. We just see it. it. If it came here, guess what would happen? Well, you said everything in space will kill you. No, I said nothing good comes from space. I didn't say nothing good is in space. Well, the light comes from space. The light ain't the sun. The light okay. is sent from the sun. Well, the light it comes from the sun, something in space. You go to the sun, touch it, and, and what, come what back. Are you talking and then we'll about talk going about to, it. Who's talking about I going want you to go something? there, touch everything. it, and come back. And then, you said everything. Once you and come back after that that touching wrong. the sun, then we'll talk. Right. Then we'll right. talk. I'll, I'll be back. I'm gonna, Just, it's <laughs> going to take me about two hours. Um, <laughs> I'll be back for a snack. But I'm coming back. Okay. Okay. So anyway, <laughs> so this, besides David Schwarzenegger's journeys into space, we continue as the Professor Dwyer and Danforth are still exploring. They find, because they're, now they're going into the deeper into the buildings, they find a room that's filled with cans of food, scraps of cloth and fur, books and manuscripts. And then this makes them believe that Gedney is, well, at least he was here, but they think he might be still alive. So they keep going deeper into these because within the buildings, there are these tunnels that go underground. They actually do find the body of Gedney and one of the dogs that he had with him. So we we will never know, at least in this version, I don't know about the original version, what Gedney's purpose was, what happened to him or what happened to the original team besides the fact that they were massacred. I kind of like that. I know today it would drive people crazy because now you don't get, I mean, they would call it a massive plot hole. I like it and I don't because I am curious what happened. However, I'm okay with it because you have to kind of fill in the blanks with your own imagination. So it's kind of cool that way. But I just would have liked to have known what, because Gedney survived and we don't know how he survived or why he survived. And we don't still don't, we'll never know why he was dissecting those bodies. If it was him, it could have been the the elder things, the Shoggoths, but we don't know. His body is wrapped up. They don't say what it's wrapped up in. But apparently someone had wrapped his body up and the dog's body. So then all of a sudden, from down in one of the tunnels, they hear this loud squawking sound. And it's a penguin. So they start going down to see the penguins. And when they see them, the penguins are, like, abnormal. They're they're bigger than men. I'm assuming six feet, seven feet tall. But the penguins are all white. and they're, But they're harmless. They just walk around squawking like dumbass penguins. Now, Mr. David, just because I'm curious, what does penguin taste like? Well, I'm assuming it tastes like a mix between probably pork 
and maybe a little deer, probably a little stringy. Um, but you've never actually partaken in the penguin? N- no, I have not, but I, I definitely can see that pork, that pork flavor maybe coming out. Um, okay. Probably a little fishy. Well, one day fishy. when we go out there, we're going to try a little penguin, you know, mm. and I'm definitely going to bring some barbecue sauce. Well, I'll, I'll do that. We can make a deal for that as long as you eat alligator. I don't eat like, reptiles. Before we go. I, I don't eat. I don't eat reptiles. I, well, I've told you this. Well, well I, I, I have religious reasons. <laughs> what religion would that be? I don't believe in, in reptiles. Religion. That's my religion. Okay. <laughs> I don't believe in eating reptiles. So if I don't believe it, I can't do it. See? Are, you guys, are you guys accredited? I, uh, it's just me. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and, and yes. <laughs> <laughs> I am a religion of one. I don't need any other church members or congregation. I'm the priest, the reverend, and the guy who passes the plate around to take your checks. <laughs> it's all me. <laughs> all right. I was just wondering. Uh, uh, a religion has to start with just one man. I'm that one man. Yeah, and in yeah, mine, yeah. we don't eat reptiles. Okay. Like, you know how some religions, they don't eat pork? I feel mm-hmm. that way about reptiles. Absolutely. Thank you. But you eat pork. I do, but they're not reptiles. <laughs> okay. I, I like a dirty pig. They taste really wow. good. I love a <laughs> dirty, filthy pig. <laughs> I love it with some wow. barbecue sauce. So mm-hmm. those who are offended that I like eating dirty pigs, too goddamn bad with barbecue <laughs> sauce. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, well, I was distracted by the millennial. Oh, um man. Then they start seeing, as they keep walking down, a flock of these white, ginormous penguins. But the penguins don't attack them, which would be kind of weird of man-eating penguins. <laughs> well, they just sit there and walk around, and they're not harming them at all. I think some of those penguins might have been Chagoss, to be honest. Or all of them. You know? Oh, really? Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking, but I don't know. Oh, I wasn't thinking that at all. Because they can assume any form. They can be anything. I was going to say, because there's a reason why I'll get to it in a minute, okay. why I don't think that was what was going on there. But because it's it said later by uh, the professor, uh, well, at least what he thinks they were, uh, why they were doing what they were doing. In the air, they can smell a couple things. They, they smell something that they smelled at the second base camp, which smells like those either the Shagoffs or the great elders, but they also can smell like water. And so... Professor Dwyer's thinking that there is a sunless sea under here, which is what David was talking about earlier, about these vast underground oceans that are supposed to be, I guess, throughout the planet. I don't know. Yeah, pretty much. I know there's underground lakes. I know that. An ocean, though, is massive. So, Well, I mean, if there are underground lakes, there are probably underground oceans. If there's any place I guess you could have an ocean like that, it would be either the North Pole or the South Pole. The South Pole was not always snow and ice it, at one time it was tropical so they had all this plant life and I, I guess you had several kinds of uh species of life there and then something happened to cause it to change into snow and ice and the tundra and all that crap so that but that so means that ocean was still there so that ocean has been there for hundreds of millions of years i don't know if i drink out of it i'm assuming it's fresh water but you got to think there's little nasties in there and i ain't swimming in it I don't know what a little nasty is, but okay. A little nasty is something that is just swimming around in your water that's moving, and you don't want that. It's it's a little nasty, so you don't you don't drink that. <laughs> and and here's the thing: if you go swimming in that ocean, you can't see what's in that ocean. No, you can't. Those things in that ocean can see you. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's like a big, it's like a huge cheeseburger floating on top of the water and they're like oh my goodness well, I ain't like, seen you one always, of them. like you always say you just gotta be quick right well yeah but i can't swim <laughs> i can drown real fast wow. but i can't swim okay i'm allergic to drowning by the way so <laughs> you're allergic to a lot of things these days. I, you know hey it's <laughs> we all got our cross to bear <laughs> i'm a man of very bad luck as i've said many times before so they keep going deeper and deeper, and they're still smelling the, the, the water, which they believe is the sunless sea. I just like that term, the sunless sea. I think that's pretty. And so they get deeper and deeper past the white six-feet-tall penguins. I'm just saying they're six feet. I know they're large, but they said they're bigger than the man, so I'm just saying six feet. 
And then once they get to the bottom, they find the four more bodies of the elder things. They are dead, decomposing. They've had, their heads have been ripped off. They think this was recent though. They don't think this was from long ago, but there is these green pools of, I guess what they think it might be blood underneath of the body. So that's why they're thinking this was recently done. But as as what happened in those murals, I guess when the Shagoths see the elder things, they immediately attack them and they go for that head. Yeah. Because the heads are always gone. All they found was the bodies. So maybe the Shagoths eat the heads. Yeah. Like, you know, head hunting cannibals because they do that too. You know, there was that time. Well, I'll tell you another time <laughs> about that. So you have to be careful when you meet a Shagoth. So David, when you're ever down in the tunnels in Antarctica, Watch out for the Shagoths because they'll go for your head. Remember that. I'll stay far away, like thousands of miles, probably. I'm just saying, if you're going to the 7-Eleven and you actually end up at the South Pole, just remember. If I accidentally end up in the South Pole, I'm going to be a rich man. Because I figured out how to travel, like, without planes. No, no what, what you did was you fell through a thinny, Dark Tower reference, and ended up there. But that doesn't mean if you come back through the thing, you'll come back. To- no, I'm going right back. Yeah, that doesn't mean you'll come right no, back when you let I'll keep jumping in. I'm <laughs> you might food. never come back. You might be in that loop. You might be going through doors and doors and doors and never come back. Yeah. And then we'll have to call you the doorman. Because that's what you are at that point. <laughs> <laughs> you see? You see how, how your adventures build on each other? See, one day I'm going to write the adventures of Mr. David. And these aren't doors, I just say that. I'm going to write the adventures of Mr. David, which is kind of a mix of Indiana Jones, James Bond. James Bond. (laughs) James Bond, you know, because there was a time when you used to wear some flashy-ass clothes and shit like that. Not suits, but those, remember those $300 pair of socks you used to buy and shit no, like that? No, I don't remember those. No, and those no. $500 pair of jeans you used to sport around? No. And, and how no. you won't wear the same shirt twice, ever? You, know, you remember that? You remember those days? Back in the None day? None of that happened. Okay. None of that happened. I remember very, very vividly. Well, your millennial mind has pushed out some of your former okay. exploits, but I was there. I remember it. I saw it. And I'll, I'll write that in the story one day for y'all, one day. What I forgot to mention is Danforth at this point is scared out of his mind because he didn't want to come out of these tunnels. He didn't want to even enter the buildings. He didn't even want to leave the plane. (laughs) He just wanted to get out of here. (laughs) He wanted to get the fuck out of here. But the professor is so mesmerized with what he keeps finding. And it just makes Danforth think that they're going to fucking die down here. I wouldn't call it at this point going insane, but he's losing his faith. He he really thinks that this is going to be the end if they keep going further and further. So sure enough, Dan hears something. <laughs> now, at first, we don't know if it's Dan's mind playing tricks on him or if there's something really coming. And he starts screaming. And he says, Professor Dwyer, we got to run. And then what we're, what we're told happens is something comes out of one of these tunnels or chambers or something. It's this huge black cloud of vapor it's starting to come up the tunnels and they start running and as the cloud chases them it's just crushing the white penguins like just a steamroll just flattening them and pushing them up against the wall it does not care about these penguins oh by the way about the penguins so professor dwyer had made the comment that he thinks that as of to in the world today of that world the penguins were food for the Shagoths. Mm. That's what they were feeding on, was those penguins that were walking around. Because the elder things are gone, or at least most of them are gone. But he thinks the Shagoths have to eat flesh. They don't eat snow or energy or anything. They need some kind of dead something. Or at least it has to be alive when they eat it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> they like it fresh. <laughs> so the white penguins were a food source for the Shagoths because he, he says this. I can't remember if he says it in the interview or when they're actually exploring the, the cave before the black cloud shows up. But anyway, the black cloud starts chasing them and they running up the tunnels. And I just kept thinking it took them forever to get to this point. Yeah. That's a long run because they're sprinting that whole fucking way. <laughs> they ain't walking. They're sprinting back up the tunnels, back through the buildings, out the buildings. And then back through the snowfield, back to where the plane is. That adrenaline is a mother. I guess so, because they were scared out of their minds. And and the thing is, Dwyer didn't see it. 
it was Danforth who saw it. And that freaked him out because that's important. I'll tell you in a minute why that's important. He just said, we got to run. And so they ran. They sprinted back. Dan couldn't wait to get back to that plane, the plane he never wanted to leave in the first fucking place. (laughs) And they take off in the plane. We don't see that black creature come out of the buildings, unfortunately. I thought it was going to chase him all the way through the tunnels. Again, nothing has to make sense, but they say it. They just think it took a wrong tunnel. It just took a wrong turn. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. So it wasn't the brightest thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It made a wrong turn, ended up at the 7-Eleven, and was trying to get to Walmart. It doesn't have to be smart. It's literally, like, indestructible, to be honest. What natural enemies does it have? Nothing. Yeah, none. I mean, other than the great old ones, but they weren't really... They weren't there. And it, it crushes white penguins. So, sorry, penguins. I mean, I'm not really a huge penguin fan anyway, so I ain't gonna miss you. They get in the plane and they're flying and Danforth is steadily losing his mind. And Dwyer's trying to talk to him because Danforth is flying the plane, but he's mumbling to himself incoherently. Yeah, yeah. And so he's saying, Dan, what did you see? What did you see? And then he keeps saying, he says this word, Tickalili. Now, Tickalili apparently comes from Edgar Allan Poe of some kind of demon, creature, or monster in his world. But the way... I read about this. What I found out about it was that it's never really described what Tickalili means. But in this story, what they're saying is that Dan saw some kind of being. He saw a creature from another world. Apparently, it made him so crazy that they had to put him in an insane asylum when he got back. Yeah. He makes Dwyer promise never to repeat what they saw here, never to show those pictures, nothing. Professor Dwyer says yes. However, he ends up breaking that promise because the Starkmore expedition's going. Yeah. And he does not want them to go through what he did. Now, personally, just because your team got massacred doesn't mean Stark, I'm sorry, it's called Stark Weather, doesn't mean the Stark Weather team will get massacred. You know, because you guys made a lot of sloppy mistakes. You really did. First, you brought no guns. <laughs> now, I don't know what guns will do against the Shogoths. Nothing at all. But I ain't going nowhere without no guns. I at least bring a cannon, something. The uh, book that I read, they they basically used salt to kill him. That's but it took them a long, long time to figure that out. I mean, you're talking like half the population of Earth gone. Yeah, they're they're in this story. They do mention their salt just yeah. around, and they don't say where it comes from. But I think I had read this before. Yeah, salt does hurt the Shugos. Yeah, I don't know if it hurts the great elders, but it hurts the Shugos. So if if you ever meet one in an alley or something, just throw some salt on it. And I I guess it's like a slug. You know, if you pour salt on a slug, they dehydrate. What it was made of was the same, basically, molecular structure as the slug slime. Right. So as they always tell us, salt is bad for you, even if you're sugar. It gives you high blood pressure. Well, I don't know if it gives them high blood pressure. Salt is bad for you in large quantities. You should cut back on your salt, whether you are human or sugar. Well... Like Sean always says, just enjoy just enjoy life. Just eat it anyway. You can, so that massive heart attack or stroke kills you. Well, you know. So as I said before, we get to that radio interview, and the, the interviewer keeps asking him, why are you telling us this now? And as I said, it's because he doesn't want the Starkweather group to go on that expedition. We don't. I really wish they would have made a sequel to or at least, I guess H.P. Lovecraft never did. But I was looking to see if anybody has. And there probably has. I just couldn't find it. But I would love to know what happens with that team. I would love to hear that. Because they already have. Now they know what happened to the original team. So I want to know what they're going to do different. And what their adventures are. And if they actually go and fight the uh, that black cloud monster thing. Mm. So as the interview is concluding, we get a cigarette commercial. Which I think is kind of funny. <laughs> they play this. I think it's called Fure de Lee cigarette commercial made fresh to smoke fresh or something like that. Yeah. 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 That's what it was. So it's like, it's like cigarettes are good for you. They're healthy. Cause I think at one time people did say that back in the day, you know, I guess they weren't worried about the cancer rates and stuff like that. But the thing I thought was interesting is at the end of the radio broadcast, the radio announcer goes, and ladies and gentlemen, never go anywhere alone. If it looks bad, don't look. And save the last (laughs) bullet for yourself. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I love that. (laughs) See, see, David, this is a man after my own heart. Always save the last bullet for yourself. That's right. Always save the last. So that means that's your fallback plan. If things Mm. go bad, you got that last bullet. (laughs) 
It's not really a fallback. Plan. That is it. Would you rather be eaten alive? Yeah. They yeah. don't kill you yeah. first, then eat you. They eat you alive. They like fresh. <laughs> not frozen fresh. Fresh, fresh. <laughs> <laughs> you will no pain. <laughs> well, that, that, that's where they were the mountains of the madness. They was in the Kokostani mountains. I'm telling you. <laughs> that's where they were. That temple, that temple that he went to. It could have been. They, it could have been. Made the, the great old ones. What Mr. Davis yeah. talking about is the, the Kokostani mountains and Colcan were, were characters from another book that we read called The City of Stairs, which is an excellent book. And in that book, there's about different gods, and each god in their own territory has their own realities and stuff like that. So that's what he's talking about, about the mountains and shit. You, all of y'all should read that book or, or just listen to our review. It's great. Yeah, either one. Yeah, I'd rather you just listen to our review because of my excellent commentary. But, yeah. you know, and, and, yeah. and David says shit too, you know. Well, sometimes, sometimes <laughs> I can find a few words. All right, so Mr. David, what's your overall thoughts on this story? Um, I liked it. I mean, I didn't have any issues with it other than not being able to hear it in the beginning. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, it was it was good. It was nice to get a, a different take, a shorter story take on, you know, what happened in this world, because I had read the other book first. So yeah. it, it was cool. Um, I definitely didn't didn't uh, bother me at all as far as like the campiness you were saying, because it's not it's not like funny campiness. It's yeah. just it's just campiness like 30s, like like 30s. Yeah. Different. Yeah. Yeah. Just a different so, time period. Yeah. I, I definitely like when they were. Talking about the murals and the um, the uh, the hidden language and the pictures and stuff like that, and I did think it was funny where he was. Uh, I think it was Professor Lake says, "Oh, uh, another civilization or another species other than humans have created language." I'm just <laughs> like, just like what? That's that's what you're so amazed about. Well, I, like, I, if I remember right, I think he meant. I think he says it, it created a language that was not human. Yeah, but he inferred that nothing else could ever do that. And well, I, like, I mean, you know, this this was a, the 30s. Yeah, <laughs> so they wasn't as advanced as us today. You know, yeah. they were still, well, although you have your own ideas about that too. So, <laughs> you know what bothered me? The only thing that really bothered me about the story is I mm. was kind of hoping that, because when I first read, because I had listened to this story, I guess, three or four years ago. I was kind of hoping they would go through the portal into that other world so we could well, see it. Okay, so at some point, at least read um, uh, the Necronomicon, the uh, Book of the Dead. Yeah. Um, because that goes actually a lot more in detail. But do they go into that world? Or do they come here? Yes, they do. Yeah. Okay. Well, they, they, they do come into this world, but there's a group of people who actually do go down into those tunnels and cross over into the realm of the great old ones yeah to defeat it i didn't know what this story was about yeah i just thought it was kind of a cool title and it was about adventure set in the 30s but until i listened to it, i didn't have any idea what they do and i just wanted them to go into because when they kept going into the tunnels deeper and deeper in i knew it was going to take us someone they're talking about the sunless sea and i was like i hope to god we get to go to wherever the great elders came from and we don't get to go. And I was like, ah, oh. yeah. I was like, why? Yeah. And I know part of it is because H.P. Lovecraft was, big, although he does show this, but he doesn't like to, like I said, you, if you look at his evil, you go insane. Yeah, it's sort of similar to what Stephen King took from him, where if you see the true form of it, the clown, yeah, you will go insane. Deadlights. You look at the deadlights, you can't look at them because you will instantly go crazy. I don't know what you see that that make me want to look at them and eyeball them, you know, <laughs> have my left eye like poking and bulging. <laughs> yeah. I don't think that's a good idea, but <laughs> well, I, 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 fine. I wear sunglasses. Okay. Oh, okay. Will that protect that'll me? Help. Will that protect yeah. me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? that'll, that'll do it. That'll see, do it. See, there's a way around everything, David, everything. Yeah. Make sure you send me all your passwords to all your stuff. Please you send, you're coming. Yeah. <laughs> you're gonna be right uh, there no, with me. <laughs> just like you said, when I'm going when I'm going to the sun, uh, <laughs> let me know how it is when you get back. How could you not want to go to well, where I gotta go to the sun? How could you not want to go where it the clown lives in the no, prim? Okay. I'm all right. What that don't even sound good. The prim. Who wants to go to the prim? I want to go to the prim. <laughs> I want to uh, see it. 
I want to go there. I would have loved to have had Roland's adventures in the prim. That's all. That's all you. you no, know, <laughs> I don't know if I don't. I don't think. I guess Roland would do that, but I don't know how he'd survive. I don't know. Um, I mean, he's got his guns. I, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I don't know anybody who's went to the prim and come back. I don't even know anybody because remember, under the Crimson King's castles, he had the doors that would take you into the prim. Mm. Mm-mm. But if people have gone, remember, because he used to throw his enemies in there. <laughs> he throw his enemies in there, and then they never come back. Yeah, there's some people I like to throw in there that I've known in the past, and I make sure they wouldn't come back. I prop a chair up at that door, <laughs> so when I'm hearing them banging, I'm just eating my cheeseburger, enjoying the beautiful sounds of. That's right. That's right. Keep that sweet music flowing. <laughs> oh, that was definitely darker shades. Definitely- <laughs> so anyway, I like this story. Uh, we may yeah, do I another story of this. It, it really depends on if David's up to it because I've got like 19 other ones. Um, yeah. So we yeah. might do this. Although there, I did read something. Somebody said that the creature that Danforth sees is the same creature from The Shadow Out of Time. And mm-hmm. apparently, I guess in that story, they reference that the creatures from that story are at war with the Shogoths of, and maybe the Great Elders of this story. Oh, wow. Okay. And that's what he saw coming out of there was their, one of their great enemies. I don't know if that's like a crossover story. I don't know, but that might be maybe what the, on the next one we do, we could do that one and see if they tie in. Because yeah, yeah, in H.P. Yeah. Lovecraft, some of these uh, connect. A lot of them are standalones, but some of them have recurring characters. So the drama kind of builds. So he was he really was building his own cosmic horror universe. So that's kind of why I like him. And there's no rules to his the way his cosmic horror works. Yeah. You could just be sitting there walking down the sidewalk eating a cheeseburger. The sidewalk opens up and you just see teeth. Done. That's it. Might get swallowed by a toilet monster. Uh, never, never let a toilet monster eat you. <laughs> Nothing good comes from that. Nothing. I'm just saying. It almost happened. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, they, another thing, um, those are uh, like, flowers that'll eat you like giant flowers that just oh the, the stuff like the that. venus flytrap things yeah yeah, yeah 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 stuff like that i mean that's just think about that man walking in a jungle yeah i'm allergic to those things too and a giant venus flytrap eats you no nah, i'm allergic i can't let that eat me it, I'll, I'll die well i don't think you have a choice but <laughs> yeah we know you're gonna die that's the point that's the whole reason of your existence when a venus flytrap gets you that's it <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all. This is the end of the episode. Appreciate all of y'all listening to the show. Until next time, goddammit.